The lifestyle simulator Animal Crossing New Horizons recently appeared on the Nintendo Switch to grace our new life of isolation and bring us the escapism we all so sorely needed. The colourful, carefree world of New Horizons Island Paradise is a pleasant and welcoming one that gives players outstanding creative freedom to craft the experience to their liking. Your very own personal island is customizable to the very last tile and can be decorated with a plethora of items and plants to create that ideal getaway resort. Here you also find yourself befriending the titular animals that come to live as your neighbors. These friends come in a range of different species, colors and personalities to make them feel like their own unique individuals. They are an interesting bunch of characters to say the least. Most people playing will not have the same combination of villagers either, making your day-to-day -day experience very much your own. Beyond the villagers who inhabit your community, there are a lot of other animals who visit you on the regular. Most of them bring special goods and services that are not otherwise available to you, like a turnip stock market and shady art dealings. This is not out of the ordinary for the series, as special events have been a staple since the very first installment, but in New Horizons, two characters in particular stuck out to a lot of players as especially unique and interesting. Flick, the eccentric artist punk lizard who loves bugs, and CJ, the energetic fishing streamer, come to town randomly to hold competitions and buy bugs and fish off of you for exorbitant amounts of money. While they do simply replace two previous animals who served pretty much the same function in previous installments, they certainly have their very own dynamic. You see, these two dudes live and work together and help each other out with their personal skills. Flick, for example, is making neat models out of fish that CJ then shows off on his streams. From the in-game dialogue, we can see how CJ is pouring praise over Flick and uses words like partner to refer to him. Where some people simply saw this as just two guys being bros, others saw something else. And wouldn't you know it, based on this, a lot of people, us included, made the assumption that these two lovely boys were in fact in a real relationship, rather than just being friends who happened to be business partners. Twitter of course went with it and chipped the hell out of the two, making lovely art and cute little messages in the process, while others, not surprisingly, tried to push back against it with claims of needless politicization and pushing of agendas by the shadowy figures known as SJWs. Because apparently there are people who still use that to refer to others in a derogatory way even to this day. Which is kind of sad, but I digress. These individuals recently found the fuel they were looking for when a screenshot from the official Animal Crossing handbook surfaced and allegedly clarified things. A small snippet of information we basically already knew, declaring that the two animals are business partners and roommates, was apparently seen as enough to disprove the homosexual relationship for some. A confirmation that a lot of people simply were seeing things that never were there to begin with. The canon had won, and the deep Animal Crossing lore was once again safe from the outside meddling as victory was declared over the formless SJWs and their dark biddings. In other words, a lot of nonsense was said. Not much of substance was added to the discourse. But one thing they did make perfectly clear. They do not understand. But it's so weird that there's a section of gamers that are really interested in this. I, I mean, I, I, I will never understand. I, I don't understand. What is wrong with these weirdos? I don't understand it. Which is fair enough, of course. You can't know everything. Learning is important after all. So... Let's give them a helping hand, shall we? Let's talk about the basic textual reading of media and why queer interpretations of said media 
is both legitimate and even valuable. Literacy is quite an important skill to have when approaching any type of media, whether it be books, movies, TV shows, or, in this case, video games. Media literacy helps us analyze and evaluate what is being presented to us. When we sit down to play a game, we are taking part of what we call the text. Everyone participating is a reader of that text, and as an audience, we negotiate meaning from it. What that meaning is depends on the reader in question, of course. Most people will have different interpretations of what is being presented based on a plethora of different factors, such as culture, gender, sexuality, race, economic status, and education level. This is to say that what a text means to you might not be the same as what it means to someone else. You may find meaning where others simply do not, and vice versa. In this sense, there is no true objective meaning to a text, no interpretation that can be factually decided by someone else, not even the author. Instead, the interpretations and the meaning of a text is decided by the readers themselves through their personal relationship to that text. Literacy does not simply mean that you are able to read and understand the text that is being presented to you. You also have to be able to recognize that there are several possible meanings to be extracted from a text rather than just your own. Your reading of a text is simply a reading of that text, not the reading. In the book What is Queer, Fanny Ambjörnsson fittingly uses J.R.R. Tolkien's seminal fantasy epic The Lord of the Rings as an example. As one of the most influential trilogies in the genre, it has inevitably been read and interpreted in many different ways by critics, scholars and fans since it first released. It has been read as a story about loss and longing, nature versus technology, and even addiction, to just name a few. It is a work that has proven quite ripe for different interpretations to say the least, and not surprisingly, one rather popular reading of the story digs deeper into the relationship between the two hobbits, Sam Gamgee and Frodo Baggins. Throughout the books, we follow the two on their journey towards Mordor, where they are to finally destroy the One Ring in the fires of Mount Doom and put an end to the evil Sauron. During this journey, we see them grow closer to each other, show physical intimacy as they gently hold hands and share a homosocial solidarity unlike any of the other characters. We can see this in their relationship during snippets, such as this one. Then as he had kept watch, Sam had noticed that at times a light seemed to be shining faintly within. But now the light was even clearer and stronger. Frodo's face was peaceful. The marks of fear and care had left it. But it looked old, old and beautiful, as if the chiselling of the shaping years was now revealed in many fine lines that had before been hidden, though the identity of the face was not changed. Not that Sam Gamgee put it that way to himself. He shook his head, as if finding words useless, and murmured, I love him. He's like that, and sometimes it shines through somehow. But I love him, whether or no. The way Sam sees Frodo and their shared intimate moments are right there in the text and are very much open for a so-called queer reading. 
The queer elements of Sam and Frodo's relationship is not always there, it is not constant, and it does flow between friendship and homoeroticism throughout the entire story. However, that does not mean that the reading is worthless or that the meaning is less there, so to speak. Amjörnsson explains that the point of a queer reading is to emphasize the cracks in the heteronormative system and show how queer moments do in fact exist side by side with the majority culture. And that includes situations that most may find to be inexplicably heteronormative. The fact is that oftentimes queerness in pop culture and media is not explicitly expressed. LGBT characters and relationships are quite commonly relegated to being hidden as connotation, only implied or suggested, never stated outright. Of course, it is more common for this kind of character to be out in the open these days, but there are still many cases where the uncertainty of connotation makes it harder to discuss representation. Because the issue with these characters and relationships being only connotated is that they also become deniable and insignificant in the eyes of the heteronormative crowd who are consuming that media. While we are in fact taking part of the same media, the difference is that the media in question is usually made for them. While expressions of queerness can be negated as crazy subcultural drivel of delusional people who simply want to see things that are not there. Some far left wing narrative around a family friendly game that has no sexuality whatsoever. They're gonna continue to try and they're going to try and push Nintendo to buy into their nonsensical claims. The first thing they think about is the sexuality of the fictional non-human characters. Yeah, that's totally normal behavior right here. Normal behavior if you're a demented, twisted freak that spends all day on Twitter probably crying about pronouns and all of this other nonsense. This right here is some peak heteronormative shit. The apex of sexual conformity. Uh -huh. Characters are, for the most part, assumed hetero until proven otherwise, which usually means they pretty much have to turn and look straight into the camera and express their preferred labels to the viewer. To be fair, this assumption is most likely a subconsciously learned behavior among people who have been conditioned into a culture where heterosexuality is not only the norm, but also seen as the default. And where LGBT people simply fit nicely into a slot as the other, something outside of what is commonly seen as normal. It is no wonder then, based on our different worldviews and experiences, that a lot of heterosexual people miss and fail to see things that we as LGBT people see. We do not blame these people for not having the necessary tools or the frame of reference to make queer readings themselves, because after all, it is not as easy as flipping a switch. First of all, you have to leave the safety of the heteronormative paradigm and learn how to make these connections to begin with. But also, you have to develop some media literacy as well. It is a whole ordeal, really. However, the way some people vehemently fight back against the sheer notion or even suggestion that there might be some gay shit going on around certain fictional characters makes us wonder. It makes us think that it might be willful ignorance of the fact that readings like the one about Sam and Frodo aren't just a bunch of nonsense. As the late queer studies scholar Alexander Doty expressed it, Queer readings aren't alternative readings, wishful or willful misreadings, or reading too much into things readings. They result from the recognition and articulation of the complex range of queerness that has been in popular culture texts and their audiences all along. With all that newfound understanding of the issue, let us turn our attention back to Animal Crossing New Horizons and the sweet boys, CDA and Flick. 
Considering we now know that readings and interpretations are very much influenced by things such as our backgrounds and socioeconomic status, it shouldn't be hard to see why a heterosexual cis person perhaps wouldn't come to the same conclusions about the two as someone who is on the LGBT spectrum. Even if it should be clear already, let's dig a little deeper anyway and talk more about the queer approach to Animal Crossing and where all this comes from. For starters, it is important to mention that Animal Crossing New Horizons is a game that even from square one can be seen as inherently queer coded. When you boot up the game and you create your character for the first time, it doesn't actually ask you for your gender and instead opts to let you choose your style. And even if you were to read male and female into these two styles, no feature, characteristic or cosmetic item is locked to any one specific. Your choice isn't even permanent. If you for some reason would want to switch style in the future, you can do so. Neither does the animal characters ever use binary pronouns to refer to you or any other playable character for that matter, and instead go for they and them to refer to other players when talking to you. It might seem like a small thing, but in truth it makes a world of difference when approaching the game, its characters and not the least yourself. The world of Animal Crossing breaches the traditional rules and doesn't conform to the heteronormative understanding of binary gender. It is a game that lets you wear whatever you want, look however you want, and it never judges you for that. Here, gender is 100% performative, expressed rather than assumed. This, of course, makes the island paradise of Animal Crossing ripe ground for queer theoretical readings from the very beginning. It is a queer environment, you might say. Animal Crossing is really an extraordinarily moldable experience that can be changed and experimented with at your own leisure. It is kind of like a big dollhouse that you are free to play around with. We would go as far as saying that the game actively encourages the player to make up their own stories and create scenarios around the island inhabitants with the tools given to them. Small things like giving the villagers items to wear or decorating their front lawns tell stories about them that are unique to your island. And this playground mentality is rather obvious from the fact that people have previously made up headcanons about characters like Tom Nook being the most evil capitalist in the world. One that will shoot you in the kneecaps if you don't give him his fucking money! Beyond that, the game gives us enough to go on to make fairly clear and understandable readings without the game or the developers being outright specific. From playing and interacting with the different characters of the world, it is clear that romance between them is a thing that does happen. Two of them even got married. With that implication in mind, it is not far-fetched to assume that romance and more developed relationships between other characters is very much a possibility. So, when Chip Jr. refers to Flick as his partner, one might make the connection that they are seeing each other and maybe even smooch a bit on the side. The argument against CJ and Flick being romantically involved is on the other hand pointed towards the fact that it never once is specified explicitly that they are indeed an item. And let's just entertain that statement for now. If that is your argument, you have to admit that the opposite is never stated for certain either, and because of that, it is still up for interpretation. The idea of hetero until proven otherwise that we talked about before comes from cultural heteronormativity, where heterosexuality is seen as the default normal, and everything else as a deviation from that norm. The other that has to be explicitly specified. Not even the snippet from the official guidebook that is supposedly meant to crush this queer reading is actually doing that. 
that someone would even look at this information and instantly come to the conclusion that Nintendo went out of their way to disprove the relationship between CDA and Flick makes it quite clear just how uncritically assumed heteronormativity is among people. This is not a rebuttal. It does not disprove anything really if you take the time to read it. It is external information that doesn't even begin to touch the text of the game, and all it does, at best, is give additional information about the two. Heck, some might even say that the added fact that they live together is even more proof of them being partners in more than just business. If you know what I mean. In the end, we can argue all day about whether or not CD and Flick factually, canonically, and lore accurately are in a romantic relationship or not. We could talk more about other arguments, go deep and hard into the things that have been presented to us to claim the answer being one way or the other. But the truth is that it just doesn't matter at all. We understand, it might be hard to hear for some, but trying to tackle this phenomenon with arguments of canon and lore of all things in order to prove something objectively is futile. You see, from all we have talked about so far, it should be evident that what is or isn't canon does not necessarily have any impact on a queer reading of media. What we have been trying to convey through this essay is simply put that texts can be seen as reflections of the reader's own lived experiences. When you, as a reader, look at the text, chances are that you will in some sense see yourself rather than the author. Hence, while looking at Animal Crossing with a queer eye might produce different interpretations and readings from your typical straight cis guy. And the point of making a queer reading is not even to formulate any underlying truth about a certain situation. As with any other reading, the queer reading is not meant to be seen as THE reading of a text. But it goes a bit further than that. Ambjörnsson argues that the queer reading exists side by side with other kinds of readings and does so specifically in order to present us with another possible way to view reality. Which is to say, it wants to poke holes in uncritical heteronormative assumptions, like for example the assumption that all characters are straight as a default. In that sense, the critical point is not that CD and Flick are factually gay. The important thing is that they just as well could be. The idea here is that queer elements are everywhere, all around us, all of the time. There is no escaping it, heterosis friends, so you might as well embrace it. Fellow YouTuber Corviday recently made an excellent queer analysis of the first two Shrek movies, and it's probably one of the best examples of what we are talking about on YouTube right now, so you should go check that out. By making readings like this, and pointing these elements out, and highlighting where they cross over or clash into the mainstream culture, we normalize and legitimize them. Most of all, we want to do this to let representation break free from the shackles of connotation, to not just be relegated to implication, to not be seen as alternative anymore. To refer back to Alexander Dotti again, we think he expressed the idea quite well. By publicly articulating our queer positions in and about mass culture, we reveal that capitalist cultural production need not exclusively and inevitably express straightness. Indeed, the more the queerness in and of mass culture is explored, the more the notion that what is mass or popular is therefore straight will become a highly questionable given in cultural studies, and in culture generally for that matter. It might still seem silly when talking about a cute game with talking animals, but by making queer readings we challenge the political hegemony of heteronormative culture and broaden the perspectives around societal structures. And the truth is that it is working. In just the last 20 years, the awareness, acceptance and representation of LGBT people have increased 
and improved for that matter, dramatically. During this time, Animal Crossing went from a simple GameCube game with a strict gender binary to one that has almost completely abolished it. That doesn't happen for no reason, and absolutely not in a world where these issues aren't taking prominent place in the discourse. The fundamentally queer environment of Animal Crossing New Horizons is a wonderfully playful and creative place that lets all kinds of people express themselves without judgement, a safe space for anyone to explore themselves. In such an environment, a lot of people will inevitably, and quite fairly might I add, see the queer codes that are floating in, around, and through the entire experience. You may act oblivious to it all you want, but to these people, that aspect of Animal Crossing is not alternative, but rather very much primary. To them, it is Animal Crossing. And right there, CD and Flick fit in just perfectly. Flick and CJ, OTP. Gay shit. I love them. They are very cute. And uh, also, Amiibo, please give yes, us. Yes, oh, of course. Uh, special shout out to everyone who uh, let us borrow their art yeah. for this video there even were some people who borrowed their art and we actually didn't have this place for it i'm sorry, sorry but uh thank you anyway yeah if thanks you, for if you see this thanks for being so nice uh and letting us use them and special shout out to kiss lexi or just lex who made an awesome and adorable thumbnail art that you saw in the end of the video you can find your stuff in a link down below and you should really check them out because they do a lot of good and cool stuff. Yeah! So we also want to thank all the additional voices, all the people who did additional voices for this video. Um, Snornat, Fat Slime, and Andrew Jones. Because they are lovely people. Thank you. Patreon! Patreon! Uh, let's thank all the lovely boys and girls and non-binary people who have helped us with making this a reality. Let's do it. Yeah! We want to thank Kay Axwell, Sweet Pink, Mark Elliott, Joel Nilsson, Andrew Jones, Anonymous, Nate Kiernan, Ben Clark, Nishtsvet, Huang Wu, Tommy Håkansson, Afayet, Saifi, Clara Roos, Baba Kenzie, Andreas, Aaron Rain, Mathias Grayman, Dat Jessica G, Chloe, Magnus, Silly Rookie, Biopanda, Roxy Jill, Starfighter, Morgan, Casey Explosion, Flynn Flamberge, Riley Rose Smith, Iantu, and Oscar Funes Galindo. And that's all of them. Yeah. Yeah. If you well, want to be in this list of lovely people, you can support us on Patreon. And uh, you can also, if you do that. You get the Discord thing. Yeah. Yeah, join our Discord. Yay. Mm, post stupid um, stuff all the time. And that is for all the levels. So it doesn't matter how much you actually con contribute to our stuff. You'll get the Discord access anyway. Uh, and also, everyone actually gets read up and stuff. Uh, at this point, so yeah. there's a lot of until stuff it is get. no longer plausible, um, and, and that knows, will be a good may thing. <laughs> and maybe, and maybe it will be plausible forever. Who knows? Who knows? Thank you, everyone. Kisses. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Fresh in is the best villain.